Well, good evening. We are in Exodus chapter 8 tonight as we continue our survey of the Pentateuch. We're going through the Old Testament, so in the morning we're going through the Gospel of John, and here in the evening we are going through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And these are foundational for everything else revealed in Scripture. They're so very important in that way. And so we're going to be covering Exodus chapter 8. We're going to kind of see how far we get tonight. Uh, My goal is to get all the way to chapter 13, but uh, we will see kind of how the Lord uh, leads us. I want to remind you, this is the uh, section of Exodus which is describing the plagues against Egypt, right? God is bringing judgment upon Egypt, and he is going to compel Pharaoh to let the people go. And if you remember, it says at the end of chapter 4, it says that the people, the people of Israel, believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. Right? This is kind of the big picture idea that God had seen their affliction. He had heard their cries. And it says that the people responded with faith. It says, chapter 4, verse 31, so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. You know, when we understand that God sees our affliction, that he cares for us, the proper response, right, is first of all trust, right, to believe in him, and then secondly, to bow low, to humble ourselves, and to worship. And so that is kind of the overarching theme as it relates to the people of God. But we're going to see as we go through the plagues that are brought upon Egypt that God is a God of justice. We're going to see some correlations between what Pharaoh had done and the plagues which come upon him. So, for example, the book of Exodus opens in chapter 1 by talking about the decree given to kill the Hebrew children. The end of the plagues is going to result in the death of the firstborn of Egypt. We're going to see how Pharaoh had increased their labor, trying to make them make more bricks even without straw. We're going to see in one of the plagues how God tells Moses to take dust from the brick-making kilns and throw it into the air before Pharaoh. And then this symbolizes then the whole dust of Egypt then becomes a plague of gnats. So we're going to see God's justice and his judgment upon the oppressor in these plagues. So I want to just give you a graphic. It's probably going to be a little too small to see, but I'm going to kind of walk you through these. There you can find many, many different versions of these uh, almost anywhere that you look. But there's 10 plagues. There is the water turned to blood in Exodus chapter 7. There's the frogs in Exodus 8, 1 through 15. Lice, Exodus 8, 16 through 19. Flies, Exodus 8, 20 through 32. The disease on the cattle, Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Boils on the people of Egypt, Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. Hail in Exodus 9, 13 through 35. Locusts in Exodus 10, 1 through 20, darkness in Exodus 10, 21 through 29, and then the death of the firstborn in Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 through 36. As many scholars have pointed out, the Egyptians were polytheists, right? I mean, they worshiped every, they had kind of a God for everything, a God, you know, for, for livestock, right? They gave fertility to their livestock, you know, a God of the sun, a God of the Nile, a God of all of these different things, and God is systematically dismantling this false idolatry. He is showing his superiority over and against all of the false gods of Egypt, including in the 10th plague, Pharaoh himself who set himself up to be worshipped as a god. And so each of the plagues can be corresponded to one and sometimes in some cases more than one Egyptian god. God is, is asserting his exclusivity in the right to be feared and worshipped. 
So that's kind of the context as we go through the 10 plagues, and we don't have time to kind of go through all of these chapters kind of verse by verse. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to point out a few kind of key uh, passages, few, uh, key verses, and kind of talk through some key uh, ideas as we go along. The first passage that I want to take you to is chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. This is during the second plague, the plague of frogs. And chapter 8, verse 8, it says that after this plague, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may remove the frogs from me and my people. And I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. So here's Pharaoh. He's acknowledging God's power. He's saying, look, I need you to entreat the Lord for me. And if you'll ask God to take this plague away, then I'll let the people go. Verse 9, Moses said to Pharaoh, the honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses, that they may be left only in the Nile. Notice how specific Moses is, right? That he wants to remove any doubt that this is going to be a consequence. He says, look, or a coincidence. He says, Pharaoh, look, you have the honor. It's your honor. You tell me when you want me to ask God to take this away. That he gives Pharaoh the opportunity to tell the timing. And Moses says that the frogs are going to be destroyed. They're going to be left only in the Nile, right? So this is not going to be an obliteration of all frogs from the land of Egypt. It's going to be those anywhere outside of the Nile River Delta, their natural habitat. Verse 10, so Pharaoh says, tomorrow. So he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They will be left only in the Nile. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. The Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields. So they piled them in heaps, and the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart, and did not listen to them as the Lord had said. You know, we all have a Pharaoh heart sometimes, right? I mean, when we sin and the consequences are pressing, all of a sudden we're like, you know, we're praying, we're asking other people to pray, we're we're ready to just come to God and ask him for mercy, As soon as the Lord removes the pressure of the consequence, sometimes we're like Pharaoh. When he saw there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said, and he didn't do what he had promised to do. How often that's true of us. We sin, the Lord in his love brings discipline to us, and we cry to the Lord, he removes it, and when there's relief, there's now no more resolve, right? If your resolve vanishes when relief comes, you can be sure that wasn't true repentance. Look down then at verse 19. So chapter 8, verse 19. This is in, after the plague of gnats. Even the magicians, right? Even these, even these, you know, those who practice witchcraft, right? The dark magic of Egypt, they said to Pharaoh after this plague, this is the finger of God, right? So even the false teachers are acknowledging this, and it says, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Notice how often listening is mentioned. He hardened his heart, and how did he harden his heart? He didn't listen. He wouldn't listen You know, throughout Scripture, listening is given as a key mark of true repentance. Daniel, when he prays in chapter 9, his great prayer of repentance and confession, he can, one of the things he confesses is he says, look, not only have we done all these wicked things, but we have failed to listen to your prophets, to those that you sent to us with your word. Did you know that the Lord is going to hold every person accountable for listening to his word? 
How are we hearing God? You know, as a parent, sometimes you realize it's sometimes disobedience is when the when you know the child hears you and decides not to obey. But there's this frankly larger category in which the child can honestly say, Mom, Dad, I didn't hear you when you said that. And the parent thinks to themselves, now, you know, I was, the child was within earshot. I didn't whisper. I didn't mumble, right? The reason the child didn't hear the parent say that is because they weren't listening. And one of the things that's so vital in the spiritual life is to listen to the word of the Lord and to heed. It's also something that you want to teach your children. Parents, I would urge you that you need to work with your children on listening, right? It's not just when they, it's not just when you know, you know they, that, that you have their attention and they hear your instruction and then just in your face disobey or rebel or defy you, right? That you need to give them instruction and discipline. It's when their minds are so preoccupied with their own agenda that your voice vanishes into the, you know, the darkness of, of uh, you know, the Charlie Brown's mom syndrome, right? Just, just, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of, they don't hear you above their own agenda. You need to work with them on that because their blessing in life is going to depend on listening to the voice of spiritual authority, ultimately God's. Right? If, if you allow them to develop patterns of ignoring authority, of just simply not listening to authority, then they're on a very Pharaoh-like path. And you need to intervene early and often to teach them to listen. One of the things that I have been trying to do more and more is to reinforce the authority of Katie's voice. Um, unsurprising to those of you who know me and know her, she's a very soft-spoken person. I'm not exactly soft-spoken. <laughs> and so sometimes my voice gets through when hers does not. I've been trying to work with the children to understand when your mother's voice speaks, your ears need to listen. Over and over again throughout this account, it will say Pharaoh didn't listen. He didn't listen. He didn't listen. Look down now at uh, verse 22 of chapter 8. God is sending a message to Pharaoh, and he says in verse 22, on that day, he's talking about the, the plague of flies, and he says, on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of flies will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, pardon me, tomorrow this sign will occur. Then the Lord did so. And there came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and the houses of his servants. And the land was laid waste because of the swarms of flies in all the land of Egypt. Notice the emphasis here. I'm going to make a distinction. I'm going to put a division, something that's going to distinguish between the Egyptians and my people. We're going to see this over and over again, this same idea emphasized again and again. I'm the Lord. I'm going to make a distinction between my people and those that are rebellious to me. And he says, I'm doing this for a reason, so that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. The Lord makes these distinctions so that it's clear that he is present with his people and that that matters, that it matters that he is with them. God protects and God punishes. There's a distinction. God protects his people and he punishes the rebellious. The world and the enemy of souls want to erase that distinction, right? The world wants to say, look, there's no difference or distinction in how God treats the righteous and the unrighteous, 
the godly and the wicked, the believer and the unbeliever. This account, and you're going to see how many times this is emphasized, should remind us from the very beginning of the Bible that that is false. God makes a striking distinction between those who are his people and those who are not. He protects his people. He punishes those that rebel against him. Look down to chapter 9, verses 5 through 7. We're going to see a second example of this distinction. Chapter 9, verse 5. The Lord set a definite time, right? So here again, you see the specificity, right? No way any of this could be a coincidence. The Lord set a definite time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So here's a second time again where this distinction is emphasized. Pharaoh even sends out an investigative team, and they come back with the report, not a single one of the livestock of Israel has died. Whereas throughout the Egyptian territory, there was not one that escaped. So this is the second time distinction is emphasized. Then look down at verse 8. This is what I referenced earlier. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln, right? This is a brick-making kiln, right? This is, the, this is what the Israeli slaves were laboring at, right, is making bricks. So Moses and Aaron go to one of those brick-making kilns, take handfuls of soot, and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it toward the sky, and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. You know, just imagine this, right? This is the symbol of the slavery, the symbol of the oppression. That soot had been produced by the toil, the oppressed toil of these Israeli slaves. Pharaoh had oppressed them, and now the very dust of the oppression is taken and thrown up into the sky in front of him, and it says that the dust then comes, spreads, and covers the whole land, right? This is divinely miraculous, right? This is not natural kind of calamities that just kind of happen to correspond. This is miraculous judgment. In fact, there's strong parallels between the plagues upon Egypt and the greater plagues that will come on the earth during the Great Tribulation. This dust settles on all the land and it becomes boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. And even the magicians couldn't stand before Moses, right? Those with the dark powers are overpowered by this. The oppression is now turned upon the oppressor. The, oppressor. the Egyptians are now reaping what they have sown, as the scripture says. Look down at verse 15 of chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 15. The Lord is still being merciful, right? He sends Moses again to say, let my people go. He warns him of more plagues to come. And then he says in verse 15, for if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you then would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. You see the absolute sovereignty of the Lord. Here is the oppressor. Here is the most powerful man in the world, untouchable by anyone the greatest army, greatest power in that time, absolute dominion, able to use it 
however he wished, and he wields it to kill the Hebrew children, to oppress them, to enslave them, to fill their lives with misery. And God says to him, look, there's only one reason you're even here. It's because I didn't put forth my hand. I didn't strike you with pestilence. At any moment, I could have done that, and you would have already been cut off from the earth. Jonathan Edwards, in his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, gave a powerful illustration. He said, the sinner is like a spider dangling over an open fire by a single thread, held by the hand of God. At any moment, God merely needs to release and the destruction comes. God says to the mightiest man on earth, the only reason you're still here is because I have allowed you to remain. I have allowed you to remain. Why? In order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. But even so, he says, you continue to exalt yourself against my people. He says, Pharaoh, you don't understand the order here. You think you're the one in power and you exalt yourself over my people. You fail to realize that there is a king of kings and a lord of lords. And it is at my decree that you stay or are removed, that you are judged or given mercy. This is absolute sovereignty. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Look down at chapter 9, verse 26. We'll see a third example of this idea of the distinction. So the plagues come again in verse 26 again. It says, only in the land of Goshen where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. So hail falls and there's this great destruction. But in Goshen where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Again, God protecting his people, punishing the wicked. Look at what happens, though, in chapter 9, verses 27 through 35. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Make supplication to the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, as soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There will be hail no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. Verse 33, so Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, He sinned again and hardened his heart. He and his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not let the sons of Israel go just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. This is the cycle of false repentance. Pressure, consequence, pseudo-repentance, relief, and hardening. It's actually one of the ways in which over time the difference between the true and false repent, uh, the truly repentant and the fake repenters becomes revealed. The scripture says that you need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. True repentance produces fruit. False repentance merely waits for what you think is God to get distracted again, right? All of a sudden his heavy hand is removed and now you have freedom to sin again. That's false repentance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I urge you to, to look at this at some point. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about two types of sorrow. Worldly sorrow, which he says leads to death, and godly sorrow, which produces a repentance without regrets. Worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Two types of sorrow. Everybody who sins and everybody who experiences consequences of their sins are sorry. But one is sorry for the consequences falling on themselves. The other is sorry for the sin they've committed against God. The worldly sorrow is just the sorrow that says, look, what I did is creating a negative effect for 
the God I worship, which is me. I don't like what's happening to me, so I'm sorry I did that. I did this terrible thing. I'm sorry I did it, right? This is, this is the criminal who gets caught. He's sorry he robbed the store. Not because he believes theft is wrong, but because he doesn't like sitting in jail. He's sorry not for his sin, but for himself. He's sorry for himself. He is not sorry for his sin. Godly sorrow is sorrow over sin, the dishonor done to God, the harm done to others. So often, there are crocodile tears, as the saying goes. Pharaoh, probably the better statement would be Pharaoh tears, right? I'm so sorry, right? I mean, doesn't he sound repentant? I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one. I and my people are the wicked ones. Ask the Lord to take this away from me. And the second that the pressure's off, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It's false repentance. Notice what happens next with false repentance. The person who has fake repentance usually tries to cut off contact with God's ministers, with God's messengers. Look at chapter 10, 10 through 11. Then he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. Take heed, for evil is in your mind. This is Pharaoh speaking. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence, right? I'm tired of talking to you. I am tired of listening to you, Moses and Aaron. So then the rest of chapter 10 again describes these episodes of false repentance. Look at verse 16. Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, right? He'd just thrown them out. Now he's going to hurriedly call for them now because the pressure's back on. And he said, I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Right? Now, he's getting a little closer, right? Because now he realizes, okay, I've sinned against God and you, right? I've, he's starting to dawn on him that there's some harm done to others. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once, right? Just one more chance, please, please, just one more chance. Make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. Moses went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. The Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, took up the locusts, drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the sons of Israel go. We talked in one of our previous lessons about the 10 times it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart and then the 10 times it says that God hardened his heart. And we saw that Pharaoh hardened his heart seven times before this time, the first time that God hardens his heart. False repentance, false repentance, and then the hardening of the heart. Notice that again, false repentance is followed by anger towards the messengers, verses 28 through 29 of chapter 10. Then Pharaoh said, said to him, get away from me. Beware, do not see my face again, for in the day you see my face, you shall die. This is Pharaoh saying, I'm done listening to these spokesmen of Yahweh. Never see my face again. You see my face again, I'm going to have you cut down in that very moment. One of the characteristics of false repentance is a desire to cut off or distance oneself from those that could bring God's message to you. It's not true repentance. A lot of people claim to be repentant, but if you look at the pattern, they're distancing themselves and cutting themselves off from anyone who could pass God's message to them. That's why Proverbs chapter 18, 1 says, he who separates himself seeks his own desire. Right? The person who separates himself from others is doing so so that he can be selfish. So that there's no one to tell him, you're being selfish and you shouldn't do that. Beware of the move away. Right? Don't allow yourself to move away from those who can confront you, who can exhort you, who can share God's word with you. False repentance is followed by anger towards God's messengers. Look at 
chapter 11, verse 7, we'll see a fourth time in which a distinction between those that God protects and those he punishes is made. Chapter 11, verse 7. This is in regard to the death of the firstborn. God says, against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these your servants will come down to me and bow themselves before me, saying, go out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, right? He won't listen. So that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Four times the distinction is made between those the Lord protects and those he punishes. In our day, this message is being lost. It is being compromised by cowardly preachers who are afraid to say there is heaven and there is hell. God protects and God punishes. And cowardly preachers fail to draw the clear line and say, choose you this day whom you will serve. Today is the day of salvation. Repent while there is time. As the book of Hebrews will say repeatedly, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. That needs to be our message to the world. The world is trying to obliterate the distinction to say either that, you know, the world a few decades ago told us, hey, we shouldn't judge anyone. You know what the world is doing now? They're telling God, you shouldn't judge anyone either. That message is not going to be heeded by the judge of all the earth. Pharaoh, too, thought he could tell God what justice and judgment should be. If Pharaoh found out he was wrong the hard way, there are many in our day who will similarly find out the hard way. But So we, in compassion, need to go to them with a clear message. One of the things that I realized long ago is I can't make anyone believe. I can't make, I can't, I can't persuade anyone to do that which they don't want to do. If they want to run from God, they will run from God. And the clearer our message is, the more likely the unrepentant person is to separate themselves from us, right? To do what Moses did. Get out of my sight. I don't want to hear any of that stuff again. There's three things I don't talk about, religion, politics, and money, right? Except for they talk about politics and money all the time. It really, they just mean, don't talk to me about God. And especially, don't talk to me about my sin. Don't talk to me about the day of judgment. I remember realizing that I was running around offering water to people who weren't thirsty. You know, I, usually there's a bottle of water here, but I was even thinking as we were singing this morning how different things would be if no one in the congregation this morning had had access to water for two days. And they come in here and they see that little bottle of water, right? We'd need a security team, right, to break up the scramble, right? But because everyone has access to water, right, the fact that there was a water bottle sitting up there probably didn't even grab anyone's notice. It's a little bit the same as true as we share the gospel. People have no sense of thirst so we're running around saying, here's the living water, here's the living water. But they have no sense of thirst. We need to make sure that they understand that they are truly in a parched spiritual wilderness. When they understand their desperate condition, then the offer of water, the living water, will be so gratefully received. We need to do that kindly, compassionately, but we need to do it clearly as well. Well, we are going to, um, I was 
I wasn't sure whether we'd have time uh, to get to chapter 12, which is the Passover lamb, and then chapter 13. So we're going to do that next time. Let me just whet your appetite a little bit. In chapter 12, we're going to read about the, the sacrifice of an unblemished lamb with the blood put on the doorpost, which causes the destroyer to pass over the homes. This is then becomes the Passover feast. In the New Testament, we're going to read that Christ... According to 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed, right? John the Baptist, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. So we'll talk about that last, next time. I almost said last time. That would be pretty interesting. We'll talk, we will talk about that last time. That's, you, can, you can see how much sleep I've been getting lately. And then also next time, I want to talk with you about a a very interesting passage. Let me just read it to you because I want to get you thinking about it, leave it as a thought for you. It says in chapter 13, verse 17, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. Can you imagine, you know, all this stuff, you finally get let go, and then God leads you exactly the wrong way, right to a dead end, and then into a wilderness. The path from where they were at to the promised land by the northern route, by the shore of the Mediterranean, would have been direct. There's water along that route. That's where the main highway, the main ancient world trade route was. It says, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. So we're going to talk next time about embracing the long path. Embracing the long path. Why God sometimes leads us to what seems like dead ends, what seems like away from the goal for our own good. What I want to do, we have just about uh, five to ten minutes remaining. I did want to, it's been a while since I've done this, I wanted to give some opportunity just for uh, questions and answers. It can be about uh, any topics. We're probably going to have just time for one or two questions, but uh, Austin has graciously agreed to take the microphone, so if you've had a question burning, just raise your hand, and uh, he will come and give the mic to you, and I'll do my best to either answer your question or give the uh, three-word answer, I don't know. Any questions that have been burning on anybody's mind? In the passage that uh, you talked about today, um, it talks about how Moses wanted to take them out to a uh, sacrifice or take them out to Mm -hmm. a feast. And I wondered... Why he didn't say, take them out and never return? Mm-hmm. And why again and again and again, two days journey or three days journey into the, for a feast or sacrifice? Right. So I, I think we see um, here, remember we, at the beginning, um, you know, God who knows the future, right? He knows that Pharaoh's going to refuse, right? And that God is going to need to compel him. Um, I believe that this is a, this is a genuine offer on Moses' part, right? If, if, if Pharaoh will heed God's instruction, right, to let them go and worship and sacrifice in the wilderness, right, that would show that, that Pharaoh is ending his positioning of himself as the oppressor of God's people, right? He's now going to submit to God. And it's always difficult to, to deal in theoreticals, right, because God had already revealed to us what is going to happen. But I, I believe this is a genuine offer to Pharaoh, right, of, of saying, um, you know, keep in mind that the, the people of Israel had gone to Egypt voluntarily, right, during the, during the time of Joseph, and they had been flourishing there, right? It was the fact that this welcome, you know, what a, an open door, right, turns into oppression in, in Egypt that precipitates this. So I think that the Lord is extending to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians the opportunity to repent of the oppression of the people, Right to to give them basically uh, religious freedom, as it were, um, and to submit to God in that way. Um, the Lord obviously knows what Pharaoh is going to do. He says, right, that Pharaoh is going to harden his heart, 
and that as a result then uh, he will let the people go. So that'd be how I'd answer that. Great question. There's one over here. Do you know of anything in history that Pharaoh was not the firstborn and that's why he was not afraid to die? Hmm. Yeah, um, I do recall something like that, but I would need to open this, uh, my computer here, to remind myself of that chronology. Um, so I, I do know there is a, um, let me, I will try to, to pull this up, see if I can. Um, we have actually some archeological evidence um, of, uh, let's see if I can find it here, of the death of the firstborn. Um, it's called the Dream Stella. Let me see if I can find it here. Sorry, it's, I got about 40 pages to look through. Tell you what, let me get back to you on that one. It's just going to take me a while to find it. I'm, I'm trying to remember where in my notes that was. But may, maybe I'll just add that, for, at least for, for the sake of time. Um, there is archaeological evidence of, of a subsequent uh, uh, pharaoh who has, he kind of has this, you know, it, it's called the dream cell, and it has a recounting which has real similarities to several of the events. So there is some of that, um, you know, that correlation, but it's, you know, our, you know, kind of our knowledge of the story is based primarily on scripture with just some, uh, some e Egyptian archaeology at times, at points, uh, coinciding. Keep in mind, though, that the Egyptians were well known for not recording their own defeats, right? Um, you know, they were not honest, objective historians when it came to uh, recording what they had done. So they, they typically would always claim victory, even if they had had a, a crushing defeat. And so, you know, they, they did a lot of revisionist history. Good question. Uh, t two questions. Mm -hmm. One quick, maybe. Um, do you think the Israelites were still making bricks and doing all this during the plagues? You never really hear from them after the initial... And the second one is, after the plague of the livestock, the appearance is all the livestock the Egyptians have are dead, but yet you see it affecting them in later plagues too. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you reconcile that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the oppression continued, right, during, during the plagues. Um, uh, you know, the, the last kind of report that we have, right, is the, the increasing of, of the quota of bricks. So, you know, I don't see at least anything that would indicate that that, you know, that that ceased during this time, right? And that, you know, the people of Israel are struggling throughout this whole, whole time, right, to understand why when God says he would, he would uh, you know, free them, why instead their, their oppression doubles. Um, so, but once the plagues start, I, I think there's there's turmoil there, right? And and um, so, how many, um, you know, you know, how many of the projects continued? How many did not? I think probably as the plagues increased, that increasingly the the Egyptians were were, were losing their their control. Certainly, by the time of the Passover, it seems that the people of Israel were were pretty much out from under the grasp of uh, at least of the direct management of the task you know, taskmasters, so. And that, there was a second part of your question, what was it? Right, yeah, so uh, when, when you look at the, the plague on the livestock, it, the, the plague came on, on, the, on all livestock who were in the fields, right? So this would not have included livestock that were in pens or barns or, or other things, right? So it, it was, it was a, a, you know, it, was, it says very specifically on, on all the cattle that were in the fields, right? So the later then episodes of that then had to do with those that, that remained. And one of the things that, that um, you'll kind of see throughout, um, let me see if I can uh, find uh, the, the passage. Look, for example, in chapter 9, uh, verse 30. It says, 
Um, so this is, this is dealing uh, with, uh, with the agriculture, right? It says, verse 31, Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax that was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they ripen late. Okay, so with almost all of the plagues, you see also God's mercy, right? So you have, you have kind of four core crops being grown in Egypt. Two of them were ruined. Two were left unaffected, right? God is, God is judging, but he, you know, he doesn't want the, you know, if all four of the crops were wiped out, the Egyptians would have starved, I mean, in mass, right? There would be mass starvation. So you kind of see God, you know, God is, is punishing, right? But it's a measured punishment. And, and so both with the livestock and with the agriculture, you see massive consequences, but not that which would leave the Egyptians themselves in starvation or, or completely destitute? Great question. Yeah. Just curious about the uh, timetable on all these plagues, whether they were quickly done back to back or whatever mm -hmm. the conjecture is, how long these plagues took. Yeah, so on some of them, it seems like they're in pretty rapid succession, but, uh, but there's pretty clearly some time gaps in between uh, some of them. Uh, so scripture doesn't give a, give a kind of a straight chronology. Um, I definitely, I mean, there's not years in between them for sure. Uh, could there be months in between them? Um, perhaps I think it's probably more likely in the, in the, you know, in the, in the weeks with some of them. And then some of them, it's almost like it's the next day, right? The text says uh, the next day. So just kind of as we interpret when the, when the, when the scripture gives a time frame then we know the chronology. When it's not mentioned, then you know we know that there's there's some time gap, an unknown time gap in between. So that would be a great one where the proper answer is I I don't know. Yeah. All right, and we'll take one more, and then we'll we'll uh, kind of end for tonight. In the Old Testament economy, we saw the Holy Spirit coming upon man for a specific purpose and God used that individual or that grouping of people for a specific purpose and yet um, we as believers in the New Testament economy have been given the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in our lives why is it so difficult to walk in the Spirit mm -hmm. that's a great question um, so, you know, Jesus clearly gave the distinction that you're talking about, uh, Phil, with when he said the, he told the disciples, right, who uh, were, were at that time, right, they're in the old covenant, right? The new covenant had not been inaugurated. And he, he said the Holy Spirit is, has been with you, but he will be in you, right? So that's the distinction between what we call in the Old Testament corporate indwelling and then individual indwelling in the New Testament, Right, so, and just kind of going a little broader, and then I'll tr try to get to your specific question. This is a really key thing to understand because it really helps us to understand some key passages in the New Testament, particularly the warning passages in the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit is said throughout the Old Testament to have indwelled Israel corporately, right, as a nation. And then the Spirit would fill individual people to accomplish specific tasks, right? So, for example, it would say the Spirit came upon Saul, right, and he would fulfill something that the Lord wanted him to do, or the Spirit would come upon David and give him power to do something. That's why, by the way, you'll see David praying a prayer like, don't take your Holy Spirit from me, right? That would be a good example of a prayer that the New Testament believer, that's a fear we don't have to have, right? The Lord is not going to take his Spirit away from us, right? Because it, the, the Spirit indwelled the nation and filled the individual in the Old Testament. In the New Covenant, each individual is permanently indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, right, why is it so difficult to walk in the Spirit? I, I think there's maybe two ways I would answer that. The first is to say, we don't know what it was like before the Old Covenant, right? Um, you, know, for, you know, for the Old Testament people, for example, as you read the Old Testament, and you're, you're kind of seeing, just to be honest with you, the lives of the Old Testament patriarchs and the kings and the people, when you think of what they, their life was like, right? 
Um, I mean, let's put it this way. We would probably church discipline a lot of those people, right, for the things that they did. Um, so there is, I think, a remarkable distinction between how people in the new covenant who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, the, the general order of their lives and their resistance against sin and other things is greatly and categorically different than it was in the old covenant. And, and it's important for people to understand that because sometimes they read, they're like, you know, like, yeah, I know this guy is supposed to be a really important guy in the Old Testament, but like, you know, if, you know, if he was in our church, I mean, we probably wouldn't let him be a member, right? He's got four wives and, you know, all this stuff. So, um, so there is a remarkable difference, right, in, in the work of the Spirit. However, it doesn't remove the challenge that you talked about, which is walking by the Spirit. Um, the thing that hasn't changed between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is how much freedom the Lord sovereignly gives to each of us, right, to make responsible choices, right? We can, according to the New Testament, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, right? We're exhorted to walk with the Spirit, which implies that we can choose not to walk with the Spirit, right? So the, I think the primary difference is in the Old Testament, right? Um, you know, they they were struggling. They would definitely struggle more because they didn't have the constant presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling. We always have the indwelling of the Spirit, right? So the, the Lord, you know, as, as it says, you know, the Lord is near, right? He's with us at all times, but we still have those, 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 those difficult choices, right, where we, we quench the Spirit, we grieve the Spirit, we fail to walk with the Spirit. So, you know, the struggle isn't ended by the new covenant, but I think that we probably, all of us, would be pretty shocked to try to experience going through the same life issues and temptations in the old covenant context. So. You gave an example some time ago of Joseph, and when he was confronted with mm -hmm. temptation, you said I, he did not have the Holy Spirit right. dwelling in him, yeah. and yet, yet he was making proper decisions, mm -hmm. and God was walking with him. Yeah, and, and I think that those, you know, those are the examples that should just remind us, right? It, it, it's, it's um, you know, what, what scholars kind of uh, call the argument of the greater to the lesser, right? If those with less benefits and blessings, right, could take these actions and steps of faith and obedience, how much more so, right, should we who have the Spirit, right, walk in obedience to the Spirit? So, well, I want to close us in prayer and, and, and we'll do, uh, I'll try to do a few more Q&As. I realize it's been a long time since we've done that and, and um, if you have questions, they don't necessarily have to be uh, about the Pentateuch or the things we're studying. They can be more broad ranging, but um, we'll try to do these a little more often. But let me close us tonight in prayer. Lord, we uh, are grateful, Lord, that you are the sovereign uh, king of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, if there was, if there were human kings, that were sovereign above all. Lord, how dark and, and treacherous the world would be, for we know the heart of man. Lord, we are grateful that above them all, uh, there is a righteous judge, a righteous king, a sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, holy, righteous, and loving God. It is you and you alone that gives us hope, Lord, because Apart from you, uh, there would be no hope or, and definitely no assurance of the ultimate victory of good over Satan and those who have joined in his evil rebellion. Lord, we are grateful that you are sovereign over all. There is no one above you. Lord, even the dark enemy of our soul, Satan himself, is not even in the same category of power. Lord, the one who is in the world is mightier than we but you are mightier than him we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world and as we've talked about lord you have given us your spirit lord indwelled us with your spirit help us who have such an incredible privilege to walk in the spirit lord to obey the spirit and to listen and heed as the Spirit applies your word to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Great questions, everybody. Go in peace.